What's up YouTube, Gemini Johnny back again with one last compilation of creepy TikToks to make you question everything. This year and all of my subscribers have been so good to me that I wanted to do one final send off for 2023 and as one final thank you, I wanted to bring you one last video of creepy reactions to round out the year. Plus, it is a very special subscriber's birthday today and I promised her an episode a long time ago. So, here it is. <laughs> I'm sure she's in the chat, I'm not sure if she wants to be named, so everyone go tell her in the chat happy birthday, I'm sure I'm telling her in the chat, so be sure and tell her happy birthday. So thank you for subbing, liking, subscribing, wait, I said, I said subscribing twice, but I do appreciate that extra. And speaking of which, 75% of the people who watched my Christmas Day video aren't subscribed to my videos? So strange to me. Hit the sub button, it's free, I appreciate it. Anyway, point being. I appreciate all the subs, the likes, the comments, the shares, the conversations in the chats during the premieres, all of it. I appreciate you guys so much. So thank you for watching, and now without further ado, let's jump right in. Y'all gotta see this. I just talked to a tree. Yes, I talked to a tree. I saw it on TikTok, so I went to my backyard, and I talked to a tree, and it responded to me. And I called my sister. She's not picking up the phone, but I need you guys to see this. Bro, if you're talking to a tree and you don't make it sing colors in the w rainbow with the wind, what is it? Colors in the wind? I I'm just, how am I supposed to believe you? You won't believe how four children survived in the Amazon jungle in 40 days. You're probably a right. Plane traveling from the Amazonian village of Araquara to the town of San Jose del Guaviare crashed. Two adults instantly met their end, but the mother and the four children, the oldest being 13, and an 11 month old baby being the youngest, survived the crash. Unfortunately, for the mother, she met her demise four days later, leaving the four to fend off for themselves in the middle of the jungle where hostile animals roam. You see, the children are members of the indigenous Huitoto group, who are well versed in the lore of the forest. Everyone connected with the case agrees that's what saved them. However, the grandmother of the four, Fatima Valencia says otherwise. She believed that her grandchildren were carried through the jungle by a duende, a leprechaun-like creature that was said to roam the forest. Though her claim is hard to be taken seriously. Well, it is a true story. From WBAL-TV, the group of four children were traveling with their mother from the Amazonian village of Araquara to San Jose del Guaviare. San Jose del Guaviare. I think that's how you say that. When the plane crashed, they are members of the Huitoto group, and officials said the oldest children in the group had some knowledge of how to survive in the rainforest. And good for them. Way to go, kids. That's why you should have some survival knowledge. That's why I took an EMT course. Yeah, I could have been an EMT. You're welcome for not pursuing that as a career. Yeah, no, that was not for me. <sighs> Saw one person throwing up, and I said, mm-mm, I gotta go. But I passed the course, barely. But I passed it. <laughs> I think I forgot most of it. That's all right. I feel like I could splint a leg if I had to. All the knowledge would come rushing back to me, a la Jason Bourne. I'm not Jason Bourne. They're already giving people the mark of the beast. There was this girl at like a grocery store. She's like, oh, I'm gonna be the first one to pay for my groceries through my hand. <laughs> I've seen this. Like this. And she goes over the scanner. She goes, and it goes, beep, beep. Right? You know, I can do that too. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, but it, it had the hand. Also in the book of Re Revelations, it said something about how you should never sell your body to do that stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, so he forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Once you do that, you're actually like, oh, that's bad. the that's the mark of the beast, right? The mark of the beast, that's yeah. What they say. 
I'm all for the future of implementing robotics into humans to make life better and easier and more functional and to extend life. I, I think that stuff's so cool. I can't wait for the next couple decades of technology when that stuff actually starts getting implemented. But I'm not going to be the first in line for it. I'm going to wait for like, you know, Gen 3 or 4. Make sure they get a handful of those kinks worked out, you know. I can handle a few bugs. I can handle a few, you know, things that need an update. I get it's technology. It's never going to be perfect. But man, you can give me legs and never get tired, sign me up. Give me a, a body that doesn't need to sleep, sign me up. Give me eyes that can record in 4K in my exact vision. Yeah, you give me some eyes that can see and record my all my surroundings exactly as I see it. I saw that episode of Black Mirror, I know. I don't, I'm not going to store it all. Just, you know, I won't even record all the time. I'll just be recording when I want to. Don't worry, the whole point of that story isn't going to happen to me. Unintentionally disturbing characters from children's shows, part two. The Scary Lion, from Teletubbies, was a very intimidating and frightening monster in one of the numerous sketches in the show. I'm the Scary Lion. Ah! EC, from Liftoff, was a genderless and faceless doll that was supposed to represent every child of Australia. That's creepy. The Wiggle Puppets, from The Wiggles, were puppets with high-pitched voices modeled after The Wiggles characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, The Wiggles are already creepy enough. Creepy cryptids from around the world. Part 15, oh. Puckwudgies. Oh, a Puckwudgie huh. is a two to three feet tall cool. being from Wampanoag folklore. The physical features of a Puckwudgie resemble those of a human, but with enlarged noses, fingers, and ears. Their skin is described as being smooth gray and at times having been known to glow. In Native American lore, Puckwudgies have the following traits and abilities. They can appear and disappear at will. Interdimensional. They can transform into a hybrid of a porcupine, troll, and human that walks upright. They can attack people and lure them to their deaths. They are able to use magic. They possess poison arrows. They can create fire at will. And Puckwudgies control Tai Pai Wankins, which are believed to be the souls of Native Americans they have killed. Native Americans believe that Puckwudgies were best left alone. When you see a Puckwudgie, you are not supposed to mess with them, or they will repay you by playing nasty tricks on you, or following you home and causing trouble. They were once friendly to humans, but then turned against them. They are known to kidnap people, use sand to blind their victims, push people off cliffs, and attack their victims with a collection of short knives and spears. Though the exact tales and powers associated with Puckwudgies may vary from tribe to tribe, all of them agree that if you see a Puckwudgie, stay away and don't let their size deceive you. <laughs> well, I've never heard of a Puckwudgie before. Yeah, it seems like a fun little dude. It can appear and disappear at will. Kind of sounds, I don't know, interdimensional to me. I don't know, I've been saying that every video. All the cryptids are inter interdimensional. That's why we can't ever catch them. What do I know? I feel like Charlie Day putting the, like, this cryptid is it can disappear. This cryptid's a shapeshifter. This cryptid, we thought we caught one, but then he disappeared from the cage. I don't know, I'm making that last one up. Take a look at this! Yeah, it looks like a little a, a big old porcupine. Have you ever heard of a puck -wudgie? Or, it sounds cute. Kinda. Oh, who's a little puckwudgy? Oh, my little puckwudgy. Sorry, disclaimer. I feel like I always gotta say it, but I'm not being. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just making jokes. Nah, fuck that. No, who's a little puckwudgy? Yeah, I never heard of that. If you've if you have heard of puckwudgies or you've ever seen one, especially. Yeah, if you've seen a puckwudgy, please, for the love of God, let me know your story in the comments or DM or send it to my email or whatever. But yeah, please let me know because I've never heard of that. I love cryptids. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to research and look into. So I'm probably going to do a cryptid video in the future. This is what would happen if you fell into a pool full of snake venom. Okay, so if you were to swim in snake venom, there's a good chance you wouldn't die. First, you probably notice that swimming in snake venom isn't very different from swimming in water. And it wouldn't really smell like anything. And if you accidentally happen to taste the snake venom, it would actually taste somewhat sweet. Swimming in venom really wouldn't do anything to you, unless you have an open wound. If you went into a pool full of venom with an open cut, it wouldn't be good for you at all. <laughs> the venom would quickly seep into your veins and give you a number of issues, mainly blood clotting. 
This would eventually clog your blood vessels and will lead to you dying from a stroke or a heart attack. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Do you really said if you went into a pool full of snake venom with an open cut, it wouldn't be good for you at all. <laughs> I don't know why that was so funny to me. I love his videos. He's great, but that was hilarious. That was what a funny thing to say. I don't know. <laughs> a mysterious voice inside this woman's head told her that she had a brain tumor. And she did. I've heard this story Years before. back, a woman in England was living a very normal life as a housewife. She was married with kids and had always been really healthy. She was sitting at home reading one day when she suddenly heard a very clear voice inside her head say, quote, please do not be afraid. I know it must be shocking for you to hear me speaking to you like this, but this is the easiest way I could think of. My friend and I used to work at Children's Hospital Great Ormond Street, and we would like to help you. The woman was completely shocked, but the voice was so distinct and clear. The woman had heard of this children's hospital, but had absolutely no ties to it. The voice then spoke to her again and said, to help you see that we are sincere, we would like you to check the following. The voice then gave her three separate pieces of information, all of which she didn't know at the time. She was instructed to check these out, and when she did, she found they were all true. The distinct voice in her head ultimately urged her to go to the doctor, and the woman did. And after a series of assessments, she was eventually diagnosed with a large benign brain tumor. And this voice continued talking to the woman throughout all of her medical testing, guiding her through. The tumor had to be removed, and after her surgery to remove it, the woman heard from the voice one last time. After regaining consciousness from the procedure, she heard them say, we are pleased to have helped you. Goodbye. <laughs> and just like that, the voices were gone. The woman fully recovered and never heard from these voices ever again. Some say these were just hallucinations induced by the brain tumor, but many others believe that this was supernatural. This woman was being contacted by these voices from beyond. What are your thoughts on this case? Uh, I mean, my first thought wasn't supernatural. My first thought was probably someone somewhere has probably invented some sort of technology to talk to you into your brain. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what Elon Musk is working on with Neuralink. I'm sure one of those three letter agencies has figured out a way to do that long ago. It's really not that crazy. I mean, our body runs on an electrical impulse and sounds are just miniature vibrations and you can just send that into your brain and if you knew the right spot to send that into but imagine you could probably make it hear a voice inside your brain again dumb guy on the internet not 100 percent sure about any of that but those are things i've read and that's what it made me think of i've heard that story before and i've always thought that like what person wanted her alive that had that kind of power and rank and pull that they could use a technology that exists unbeknownst to the public to implant thoughts and words and voices into your head i think that's way scarier than paranormal stuff but it also could have been yeah like an angel or something like or whatever you know something spiritual speaking to her some guardian angel type of thing or maybe the b tumor had grown sentient and was telling her <laughs> get me out of here no i know yeah i don't know all i know is that governments all governments around the world have technologies that we are unaware of and it seems like every year more and more things get uncovered of how those technologies are used against the public and i'm sure some people use those things to their advantage too somebody needed that woman alive and she is so well that's good you know at least they're doing something good with those weapons please pray for post malone he hasn't been the same after this The problem is he came too close to an evil spirit. Yeah, so this object that Zach Baggins has at his haunted museum in Las Vegas, it's called the Dybbuk Box. And this goes back generations and inspired the movie The Possession. Um, it's, it's a really scary be, box. Right. Uh, Dybbuk, by the way, is Yiddish for malicious spirit. Mm. So, so it's uh, bad. Exactly. So while they were hanging out at the museum, they took the glass case off of it. And the reason they have a glass case, Zach says, is because there is a lot of so that's Zach activity with So that. Zach is actually touching the box, which you're not supposed to do. Exactly. And then you see, is that right? You're not supposed to touch yeah. it? Not supposed to touch it or open it. And watch, Post freaks out. He's like, I don't want any part of this, man. He turns on the light. I love it. He turns on the light. <laughs> and play. He's like, I'm not doing this in the dark. But you're not supposed to touch the box. And I guess yep. Post, we don't see him actually touch the box, but he touched Zach while Zach was touching the box. So anybody exactly. who touches Zach gets possessed if, you, if you're doing it while no. he's touching the box exactly it almost went through him like um electricity kind exactly of. <laughs> electricity <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah no, no it's it's like if somebody's getting shocked and you touch them you get shocked too yeah they did uh i remember when that happened it, i 
Dude, I'm sure he's seeking some sort of spiritual spiritual cleansing or protection or something. But he also that video that first video they showed, everybody was all worried about him saying he was using all kinds of drugs and all this and that. He's just a, he's an odd dude. He's a musician, man. He's an artist. I don't know. Leave him alone. I never thought that that video looked like he was on drugs or anything like that. I always thought that he just looked like he was it was an awkward moment in the middle of a conversation where he was just like, yeah, yeah, of course, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Clearly just got asked for a picture and he it just was like, yeah, yeah, man. Let's go. Let's get a picture. And he's just awkward and weird, you know, because he's an artist. I love Post Malone. Leave, leave Post alone. Leave Post alone. All right. Horrifying things caught while camping. Some teens are around a campfire, presumably in the woods, watching cartoons and goofing around. Eventually, one of the girls leaves, and they realize she's been gone for quite a while. Yeah, I know. For legit, though, like, Alexis has been gone for so freaking long trying to actually boot. The video clips a bit, and it shows one of the guys standing around, clearly worried. Um, can a couple of people just come with me just to make sure we're good? Yeah. A few of the guys go out, looking for the missing girl. Slowly, they become more and more concerned about her well-being, and their voices get frenzied. Eventually, we hear a scream in the distance, and they start rushing after it. Alexis? Alexis. Shit. In the woods, a stick structure is built up, and they slowly approach it, only too quickly, terrified, go running. <laughs> what the fuck was that? <laughs> so dumb, dude. What? Oh, it had me going. Man, that one got me good. Man, I was hooked into that story. I wanted to know what happened next. Uh, did they get out? Did they get back to their... Did the thing get them? Like, I need an ending, man. Have you heard the terrifying mystery of room 2805? On an ordinary day in May, an unidentified woman called the Plaza Hotel in Oslo to make arrangements for herself to stay. And a few days later, that woman arrived at the hotel and checked into room 2805. She registered under the name Jennifer Fairgate from Belgium. She got the keys to her room, headed up, and placed a do not disturb sign on the door. And from there, it's a mystery. The woman seemed to keep to herself. Three days into her stay, the front desk realized that they didn't have a card on file for the room. So on Saturday, June 3rd at 7.50 p.m., a security guard went up to the room, knocked. A few seconds later, he heard a shot. So he runs back down to the security desk for help, leaving a gap of 15 minutes where it's unknown if anyone left the room. Security team got to the room, knocked, to find it double locked from the inside. They eventually get into the room to find that woman alone and gone. But once they started inspecting the room, the scene didn't quite add up. It appeared that woman had just gotten out of the shower. She was nicely dressed, wearing high heels. She looked like she was about to go out for the night. And when they looked through her belongings, they couldn't find an ID for the woman. She had no wallet, no keys, no cosmetics, no toothbrush, no hairbrush. And even stranger, when they looked at the woman's clothes, every single label on her clothing was removed. And even stranger, one of those bags that she brought was filled to the brim with ammunition. So, did this woman really have no ID, no belongings, no toothbrush? Or did someone remove it from the room in those 15 minutes? I'm thinking the latter. The entire scene suggested foul play, but police saw no evidence of a struggle or any sign that anyone else was even in the room besides her. All authorities had to go on was the name and address that she gave at check-in. From there, police notify Belgian authorities of this woman's case so that her family can be informed. Their response back was, who? Jennifer Fairgate doesn't exist. And what about the man that was with her at check-in? Police find that the woman found in that hotel room, Jennifer Fairgate, doesn't exist. They got no hits on her fingerprints found in the room either. So investigators travel back to the Belgian address that she gave at check-in. They felt that this had to be a lead as the address and phone number given led to a specific town. But when they got there and asked around, they found that nobody in the town had ever even seen this woman. So what was the connection there? And it gets even stranger. Newspapers publicize this case repeatedly. Sketch photos of the mystery woman have circulated for decades in several countries, but no one has ever identified her. And this all transpired in 1995. No leads. Everywhere they turned was a dead end, but there was one question that a front desk associate had that could break the entire case wide open. According to her, she said the mystery woman wasn't alone at check-in that evening. She was with a man, one Louis Fairgate. She even named him on their registration paperwork. The plot thickens. So who is Louis Fairgate? But the bizarre thing is, no one ever saw this man again and there was no trace of him in the hotel room. Only room service was ordered for one person, only her prints found at the scene. 
and police looked into Louis Fairgate to find that he doesn't exist either. So who was this man and where did he go? And he has never been identified either in decades. Did Louis Fairgate slip out the door that day with all her belongings? And what happened in that hotel room? Investigators say that whoever this woman was did a really great job at concealing her identity and say that this investigation has been like trying to track a ghost. I say that someone made her untraceable. And the question remains, who were these people? Were they on the run or undercover? This case is mind bending. What are your thoughts? What a case, man. I'd never heard of that before, but it's a real story. It's a real case. Not that that girl's stories are ever in question, but I just looked it up to be sure. And it is a real case. It's spelled F, I don't know how she spelled it, but it's spelled F-E-R-G-A-T-E. -E. And there's a picture over there. As soon as you Google her, Unsolved Mysteries left a few Jennifer Fairgate details out, which I don't know, I guess it's spelled both ways. I'm actually, it's spelled more F-A-R-G-A-T-E the first article or like the Google result or whatever. It's so weird. It's the second time today Google has given me the wrong answer for something. I looked up the Chinese New Year earlier and it said it was February 2nd, but then other websites said it was everything else said it was February 10th, but at the top of Google it said February 2nd. Why is Google being wrong, dude? What's going on? Listen here, Google. Yeah, it's kind of like the, and I love those like mysterious person vanishes and because it, it's probably not nefarious at all. It's probably just a person that had their own personal reasons that aren't exciting that she wanted to be in that hotel anonymously, an affair. She could have been running from a bad relationship. She could have been running from the government. She could have been running for, you know, a million reasons she could have wanted to be in a hotel under a pseudonym. You don't usually want to die when you're under when you're in a hotel under a pseudonym. That's strange. Yeah, obviously that's a crazy story. And I do find it odd that she only used the sketch photo of her and not the photo that pops up when you first Google her. The first thing that pops up is a, fo a real photo of her. So well, maybe that makes it more mysterious to just use the sketch photo. Anyway, great video. Glad I found part two. These are the most brutal execution methods done by North Korea. Part yeah. one. Yeah, first, fuck North a couple Korea. years ago, Kim Jong Un killed one of his generals by ripping off his arms, cutting open his torso with knives, and then tossing him into a tank filled with flesh-eating piranhas. This is so inhumane. That's wild. But let's be real, who else but North Korea would do this? Up next, a North Korea defector named Hee Yeon Lim said in 2017 she was forced to watch a group of 11 musicians being viciously executed by an anti-aircraft gun at a football stadium after they were accused of making a pornographic video. She said the anti-aircraft gun shot one of the musicians one at a time, and each time they got shot, their bodies just completely disappeared. Kim Jong-un is an absolute crazy man, and this honestly just proves it more. Told you. This is the disturbing truth behind Got Milk. Okay, so everybody remembers the insanely large campaign Got Milk with the message being that milk is the most nutritious thing anybody could consume. It had major celebrities backing the campaign, but what if it was all a lie? Back in World War II, soldiers relied heavily on milk to survive, leading to a huge demand in milk. However, once the war ended, there was no demand for milk at all. But the rich and powerful already invested a lot of money building up the milk industry, and they were not going to let it die. And it is said to keep the milk industry alive, the rich and powerful paid off the government to advertise milk everywhere and make it seem like milk is the healthiest thing ever. So are the benefits of milk really true? I mean, I never really put two and two together, but that would make a lot of sense. It's the same story with like high fructose corn syrup and honestly like half of the stuff that's in American foods today. It all comes down to a hundred years ago, different corporatists had their hands in different pockets and made their thing successful. It's, you know, it's how it happened back in the day. It's how it still happens today. I don't, you know, I don't know. The, I remember the Got Milk marketing campaign well. I had their posters all over my wall. My family worked in dairy, so I had their posters and their pop-ups and shirts and all that kind of stuff. Back in the early 2000s, getting those Britney Spears Got Milk posters. Yeah, of course I remember the Got Milk campaigns. It was half of my childhood decorating abilities was Got Milk posters. So the other day, me and a bunch of friends decided to go explore a park that was located nearby all of our houses. And in the creepy back area, you found a lot of coffins. And we got curious and opened one and there were spikes inside and it reminded me of one of those medieval iron maidens and then we found this table nearby it looked like one of those tables that you like tie people to and uh torture them so uh mad sketch 
Maybe if you blow this up, we'll come back at night. This is terrifying. No, no. <laughs> Hola. No mami. Uy, se escucha un bebé. No mami. Uy, güey, se escucha un bebé. No mami. Wait, wait. No mami. Dislike that? Not a fan. Yeah, Demon tries to lure me as a crying baby. It ain't gonna work. So there you have it, folks. One last episode of Creepy TikToks for the end of 2023. This year marked the start of my YouTube creator journey, and I appreciate all of you for joining me. I'm still learning, trying to get better every single episode, every single video that I drop. So I appreciate you sticking with me, especially if you've been around from the beginnings and saw some of my earlier, a little bit more rough around the edges videos. No, they still kind of are, but you know, we're getting there. One more big happy birthday to my OG subscriber. She knows who she is. She's in the chat, I'm sure. And thank you all for watching. Hope you have a wonderful new year, and I will see you next week. I'll be back to my regular posting schedule of Tuesdays and Thursdays. And until next time, which is next year, stay creepy.